testimony, and he's the one who uh, helped us and created this video for us. Absolutely amazing. You know what else is amazing? The incarnation is amazing. It's amazing that God came down from heaven. He came down to this earth. He became one of us. He came one of us to redeem us, to bring forgiveness to us, to rise again from the grave that we might have eternal life. Amazing what God has done. But he's still not done yet. And so we turn to Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua says, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I am sure that if I asked you to think of some amazing things, you would be able to think of those pretty quickly. Some amazing things that if you tried to tell someone, and maybe you have about what you saw, what you experienced, and how amazing that it was, that you might think, they might even say to you, boy, I guess you had to be there. You know, some things defy description as how amazing that they really are whenever you experience them or when you see them. I'm sure that if I asked you to make a list of, of 10 amazing things, you'd come up with your own list. And so I want to share my list with you. 10 things, and number 10 is the most amazing in my heart and mind and my understanding of things. But let me share these with you, and you'll come up with a different list You'll see that there's some fun in this. You'll see also there's some seriousness in it, in it as well. This is what's amazing. A sermon under 10 minutes. That's amazing. Not today. Number two, the crossing of the Red Sea on dry land. Amazing. Amazing. And when you think about that, and you think about how God, in Moses lifting up the staff that he had given him, that the waters parted and the children of Israel went across on dry land. It's only been done twice. Uh, we, we know that Moses did it, and we saw Charlton Heston do it, okay? Number three, amazing. A teacher who gives no homework. Uh, amazing. Now, I know parents and others and educators are going to be on both sides of that, okay? But a teacher who gives no homework. Number four, David killing Goliath slaying Goliath. A, a 14-year-old, do we have any 14-year-olds here? But a 14-year-old shepherd boy with some rocks in his uh, pouch, uh, some smooth stones, and using a sling like this, like he had in order to protect his flock from wild animals, and then releasing it with just the right timing, and it finding its spot right here in Goliath's forehead, and the giant collapsing and falling to the ground dead. 14-year-old boy, over nine-foot giant Goliath, down. That's amazing. And I'm a child at heart, so I read those, and I think, wow, it's amazing. It's so cool. Next, uh, we're setting Mr. Lurkey up uh, for the future, for another date in, in time. Uh, amazing is a principal who, on the last day of school, buys ice cream for everyone. For everyone. Remember that, students especially. Number six, and again in all seriousness, it's amazing this belief and sure and certain hope that you have and I have about the resurrection unto eternal life. That when we die, we live in heaven with Jesus. This past Tuesday, Midgey Schmidt, 97 years old, the oldest member of our church at that time. Uh, she received Christian burial. She had already gone to be with Jesus. On Friday, uh, Ken Ponto, uh, a longtime member here also, um, his wife died back in 2012. Um, but amazing, he had received his heavenly reward and is blessed by the resurrection unto eternal life because of faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. Amazing, eternal life for you and for me for a future date and time when we're going to see family and friends who've gone before us, some that we miss sorely and dearly. We wish they were here right now. But they've gone on before us into heaven, and we have an opportunity because of faith in Christ, the gift he has given, to see them again and spend forever with them. Next, a person who repents of sin. Someone who says, 
I am sorry. Someone who says, please forgive me. You know, in those moments, it's literally like, sorry, Karen, I'm going to put my uh, hand on the cross and put fingerprints on it, polish it up again, uh, or whoever's on altar guild this month. But when we, when we hear someone say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, we cling to the cross and we extend the same forgiveness we have received from Jesus to them. How loving an exchange, how powerful of an exchange that is for someone to say, I'm sorry, and for you to say, I forgive you, for you to say, I am sorry, and for someone to say to you, I forgive you, and to know that kind of forgiveness is available to all, to all people. We are all sinners. But that's amazing when we come to that and we extend that and receive that forgiveness. Number eight, it's amazing when a teenager says, thanks mom and dad for grounding me. I deserved it. Yeah, yeah. Or mom and dad, I, these are things I think of. This causes parents to faint. You should try this, youth and children. Try this at home. This will be fun. You know, but go up to your parent and say, oh, no, no, let me do the dishes. Watch them drop to the floor. They'll faint right there. Or you tell them, you know what? I'm going to get up. I'm going to take the trash out. Don't worry about it. I got it. I got it. Okay? Amazing things. I, I'm teasing our youth. And, of course, you know that, I know that many of you do a lot of chores at home, and that's amazing, too. That was supposed to be funny as well. But. <laughs> a couple people are with me here, and uh, I'm okay. Next. Chapter 25 of Matthew. It's a chapter on judgment. So it's coming down to it now. This is where the rubber meets the road. It's heaven or hell. Heaven for the believer. It's hell for the unbeliever. It's heaven for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And for those who have rejected that same gospel and that same message, it's hell. And here's what Jesus says. He says to those with faith in him, when you're standing at the gates of heaven, waiting to enter, he says, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And you're puzzled. You think, okay, when did we do that? When did, when did we welcome you? And he reminds you that whatever you have done to anyone else, you've done it unto me. How you treat others is how you treat Jesus. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And so it is here at St. Paul that in the reach, teach, and care for all people, we desire to be the most welcoming people on the west side of Cleveland and beyond. And we're moving that way. We're moving that way. Our greeters are helping us with that. But for all of you to know that we are all in this greeting program, if you will. If you're sitting here, if you're a member of St. Paul, the expectation is, is that you would be a warm and friendly and greeting purpose, pe uh, people. And person. That does mean too, there are going to be some Sundays we don't want you greeting people because it's been a bad week for you. But others can cover for you. Don't worry about those Sundays, okay? Or those Saturdays or Mondays. But we're all in this together. And one of the things we discovered is that we're not so welcoming to one another as what we call St. Paul. So let's start there by being warm and welcoming to each other and extend it out far beyond these walls, far beyond a Sunday morning or a service, and get it into our neighborhoods and into our workplace, into the office, into the factory, into the work that we do, or into our retirement, whatever it is that God has us doing there. What amazing people when we grasp and take hold of what Jesus means when he says to you personally, I was a stranger and you welcomed me, and there will be people in heaven who will welcome you and say thanks. Thanks for how you reached out to me. Finally, number 10, the most amazing of all in my heart and mind is a soul that's one for Christ. Someone who didn't know Jesus and now they do. Someone who didn't know about his forgiveness and now they do. Someone who didn't understand how important the cross is. Someone who didn't grasp the, the width and breadth and depth of his love for sinners and for all people. And now they do. A soul one for Christ. 
and by the power of God's Spirit added to the number in heaven one day that we will see and enjoy. And I just hope that uh, I'm in the same neighborhood as they are and as you are for the sake of Christ. A soul one for Christ. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. Now, you may have your own list. You can list yours. You can order yours if you want to. You'll find, uh, as I did, it's hard sometimes to rate them because, well, wait a minute. No, I think number five should be number eight. I think number three should be number nine. It, it's hard, and you keep rearranging those things as to what is the most amazing in all of this. Here at St. Paul, we have an amazing school. We have an amazing educational partnership with Lutheran High West and East. We have an amazing church. We have an amazing staff. We have amazing volunteers who week in and week out. I think we, we have added it up. It takes about 60 to make what happens on Sunday in our services happen. And they're volunteering their time. We have amazing people who give of their time, their talents, their, um, their gifts, their abilities, things that they have learned and grown in and talents that they have developed, that God has developed in them absolutely amazing what God is doing. What God has done, if we could see it over 159 years until today, well, we're reminded of what Joshua said, get ready for tomorrow I will do amazing things among you. And we have a lot of tomorrows ahead of us, a lot of years ahead for St. Paul Church and school and our proclamation of the gospel that continues to thrive and grow people in Christ. Absolutely amazing. Let's get to your outline here, help you fill in a few uh, items here, and also get to the heart of, of our message as well. First of all, uh, Joshua speaks clearly of consecrating ourselves, preparing ourselves, hearts and minds, and, and even physically getting ready, like you're getting ready for, for some athletic event or endeavor, getting ready for it, like you're getting prepared for a major exam or test. Get ready and prepare yourself. Consecrate yourself for God's continuing and amazing work among us. We are to be, and by him you will be, encouraged, motivated, and prepared encouraged, motivated, and prepared. That's what God desires in you, and he does it through his word, he does it through his spirit, he does it through worship, uh, he does it through Bible study, he does it through uh, other discipleship opportunities, but not only does God do it, but he calls you to be part of that too. That you would be part of the people around you, the body of Christ here, and those who come and go, the strangers that, that aren't friends yet, that you would also be an encourager to one another, that you would be a motivator of others, and that you would help others get prepared. You know, parents get that. If you've been a parent, you are a parent, you know that being a parent, that, that you're doing that for a lifetime. You know, you're encouraging, you're motivating, and you're preparing for what's next in the, chap the next chapter of life. In, in childhood and youth, there's a lot of that that seems very direct and very clear. I will tell you, it gets a little fuzzier when your uh, adult children get in their 30s, but you still are encouraging and motivating, and you're still preparing them for what's coming, even as you pray for them and lift them up before God, absolutely. And then our consecration and our, our preparedness, it comes, it comes through A, acknowledging His presence everywhere. Acknowledging his presence everywhere. God is present everywhere. I have mentioned before that I encourage you to make a book of the Bible your book. One that you deep dive into, you dig into it, you know it backwards and forwards. Uh, if you want to memorize it, that's fine too. Pick a short book if you do that. But Joshua is mine. Every chapter, every verse, I mean, I know it's width and breadth and depth, and I'm still growing and learning through the study of this book. You know, I read through the Bible. I, I know the Gospels. Matthew and John are my favorites there that I have dug deeply into and more into. But all the books of the Bible, and here I've singled this one out to really know it well. So here we are in Joshua 3, 5. Let me tell you what's happening as far as acknowledging his presence everywhere. God said to Joshua in 1, 9, he said, Have I not commanded you? You've heard these words before. Have not I commanded you to be strong and courageous? Don't be discouraged. Don't be frightened. For I, the Lord your God, am with you wherever you go. God is present everywhere you go. 
anywhere you can think of to go, God is present there. Not just here, everywhere you go. But here's the powerful extension of what that means. At that point, Joshua sees Moses' sandals in the sand. Moses is gone. And, and he's, he's thinking, I've got to put those on. He's got to fill Moses' sandals. But he's hesitant. And that's when God says, have not I commanded you? Get those sandals on, Joshua. And he starts slipping his toes into the sandals. He puts them on, shakes the sand between the feet and the sandal leather. And then God says this, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I could see Joshua, whoa, <laughs> taking steps back in Moses' sandals saying, are you serious? He remembers how God was with Moses and what, he, what God did through Moses. Not only the crossing of the Red Sea, but the ten plagues, the whole thing, the water, the quail, the, uh, the, the manna, the everything, and, and more and more. Uh, he got it. Do you get it? Acknowledging his presence as God was with Moses and Joshua. And this is repeated for many of the Old Testament prophets and even kings that were godly kings. God's promise, I will be with you. Wherever you go, God is with you. And God is with us, with our church, our school. God is here and God is in it. And he will not abandon, he will not forsake. Acknowledging his presence everywhere. B, listening to God. Listening to God. Growing a, a sensitive spirit and heart toward what it is that God is trying to tell you. How God is trying to reach out to you and communicate to you certain truths and things that will be exactly what you need to know for today and for tomorrow for your life as he does amazing things in your life for you and through you. He's not done yet. Whether you're three years old or 13 or 33 or 103, he's not done yet. Listen to God. Listening to God means to be in his word. It means to go to him in prayer and then stop and say, I wonder what he's saying to me. And so many times you do figure it out. You know, when General Joshua, I'll use that title for him now because he led the children of Israel into the promised land, conquered the enemies of God. Uh, there were some failures there in other ways. But he went in, and do you know of all the battles that they fought? This is what happened. They went into battle, they defeated the enemy, they were victorious. They went into battle, they defeated the enemy, they were victorious. They went into battle, they defeated the enemy, they were victorious. They went into battle against AI, and they were defeated. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're a really good team, and you know you got a really good team, but you get beat by the league's team that's in last place, that's kind of what happened at AI. It's like everybody had to be shaking their heads and lives were lost. This is serious business. And then Joshua was humbled when he reflected and realized he's a sinner just like you and me. He had failed to listen to God. He had failed to approach God in prayer. He was facing another battle and he had failed to consult God because they'd been victorious, victorious, victorious. We're doing pretty good. Don't forget that those victories come because of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who goes before you like the Ark of the Covenant in God's power and all of his resources and all that he can bring to bear upon decisions and choices you're making for the future. But never fail or forget to pray. So there's AI, and then there's... He got it down, and I'll add this piece to it pray, <laughs> go into battle, be victorious, defeat the enemy. He always did that. And it, it went something like this. When you read the book, it's like he talks to God. God says, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to approach this. And he'd go to the people and say, God, this is how we're going to do it. And he'd always go back. He would receive from God by listening, and he'd come and tell the people, this is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Always acknowledging that it was God who was in this and getting this done for them. And thirdly, see, 
our preparation, our, our being consecrated comes through following Him and doing His will. And that means seeking His will. It means listening to Him. It means acknowledging Him and His presence in your life so that you have some sense of what His will is for your life, that you're getting some clearer direction day by day as to what you should do and the next step to take and which turn you should take and which turn you should not take. But listening to God, following Him, doing His will. You know, the closer you walk with God by being in His Word, by worshiping faithfully, guess what? The more you do that, the closer you walk with Him. The more your decisions and choices will reflect what God wants for you. And His will will be preeminent in your heart and mind as to what to do. Um, many of you don't know this, but uh, my ancestry, I'm sure if I did DNA, it would be all different. But uh, I do know that my great-grandmother was full-blooded Cherokee. I know on my mom's side, it's Irish. So Cherokee, Indian, and Irish. I don't drink much, but I do enjoy it once in a while. Um, that was a joke. But in this story, an Indian is out on the plains and he's got a little campfire and he's, he's trying to send a message to villages and tribes around him. So he's using smoke signals to communicate with them. And so he keeps sending these smoke signals up. And while he's doing that, for some time he does that, all of a sudden, behind him, there's this massive explosion that takes place. Almost like a nuclear explosion. He turns around, he sees this mushroom cloud going up, in, miles up into the heavens. And he looks at it for a moment, eyes wide open. He turns back, he looks at his campfire. And he says, I wish I had said that. God has said it. And I hope that you heard it today. Get ready. Because I'm going to do amazing things among you. In your life. Through you. In the name of Christ our Lord.